Live from the 607, it is the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Why don't you join in the conversation with the hashtag ODPH. Here we go. And welcome to another edition of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I am your host, Ken M. Sitting across from me this week is the intern himself, Padawan Jay, holding down the soundboard. Holding it down like the Yankees are holding down that offensive destruction. Man, the Yankees are on fire right now. Absolute tear. We're going to get to that just a little later in the show, but we have to get to the biggest sports news of the week, and that has to be the NBA playoffs, and dare I say... What is going on with the Cavs and the Celtics? Uh, That is LeBron and the entire city of Cleveland saying, I told you so. You know, it's just a tricky thing to see how the teams play in the playoffs. Because you have a team like Boston who doesn't have their star players, but yet make a statement wins in game one and two. Mm -hmm. And then we go to Cleveland, where Boston only has won one road game this entire playoff series. Yep. And Cleveland is a whole new team. It's like Cleveland's all of a sudden playing NBA 2K18. Whatever the case is, the role players finally got involved. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all LeBron trying to do everything he can. But he did definitely some work these past two games. Oh, he's he's putting in his work. No, his his numbers for the entire NBA playoffs stand as such as we record. Uh, 33 points per game, 9.4 assists per game, 9 rebounds per game. 1.4 1.4 steals per game. That's a 54% field goal percentage. Six 40-point games. Three triple doubles and two buzzer beaters. This man just went and played NBA 2K on rookie. You know, it's just hard to keep track because he is setting point records and just records all over the place. I can't even do it justice. No, He's yeah. Just, he is just playing like a man possessed. And as a Cavs fan, you got to be excited about that. There's well, you, you got to be worried and then kind of skeptical, kind of hopeful, and then over the moon, let's go. Yeah, because it's just like we're saying. It's a day and night difference of what happens just of a home game to a away game. And for the Celtics, now you kind of have to sit back and go, what just happened? Well, yeah, because you, you, they had their first loss in the series, and I believe it was Terry Rozier says, oh, we needed this. We were too confident. We were too cocky. It was a wake-up call for us. And so I go, okay, that makes sense. It's understandable. And figure, and they'll come back. This they'll have, they'll win the second game. Then you know the next game, or it'll be close. And then they lose again. I'm like, all right, well, if first loss was a wake up call, what's this one? That's the question because I could understand game three, Cleveland was going to come there, and the energy in in the Quicken Loans Arena was going to be on fire. Mm-hmm. There was no other way that game was going to go out. But it was just scary to see that how they did it. And they just, I mean, they won a huge in Game 3. Oh, yeah, Game 3, they started contesting shots. I mean, Game 3, they contested 76% of the Celtics' shots compared to 58% in Game 1 and 2. Uh, you know, I'm no basketball expert like Coach would be, but you can test more shots. Odds are you're going to do better. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And Celtics just had no answer for it. No. No, I mean, they looked lost out there. They looked very lost. I mean, that's the only way you can describe it. They just looked sloppy, and they just did not match the intensity for Game 3, and LeBron and company did what they needed to. But the more shocking thing was Game Mm 4 because the Celtics did show some life, but Cleveland, especially Trinson Thomas, Thompson there, excuse me, was – all over the place with the defensive pressure. So it's almost like he had, you know, he had a special box of Wheaties, you know, that he, you know, he saves for special occasions in the back of his fridge, and he had them for breakfast. However, you want to describe it, he just went off, and he was making sure he was shutting down everybody underneath. I mean, Horford did not have a great game. Rozier, no. Rozier did not have a great game, and it just looked like LeBron and company finally got into that playoff swing. No, yeah, I mean, I mean looking at the box score, Morris had 10 points, Horford had 15, Jason Tatum had 17, uh, Rozier had 16, and J- uh, Brown had 25. You know, and everybody else on the bench, the three other players on the bench who played, didn't have anything more than eight. Yeah, and when you do that, you know, there's just – it's self-explanatory. I don't mm-hmm. even think I need to break it down more. But now going into Boston – this now, to me, this is the Cavs must win. Not, Absolutely. Not Boston. Not Boston. The Cavs need game five. I would argue every game until the Cavs win the series is a must win. No, no. I. This is my point I'm going to make with this one. Boston 
has the best home record of the playoffs thus far, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And they are going to come there, and they are going to definitely want to rebound. For Cleveland to win this series, they need Game 5. They do not want to get into a Game 7 in Boston. No. Un- under no circumstance. No, I don't think any team in the NBA does. No, but especially Cleveland because, I mean, as streaky as this series has been, and that's the only way you can describe it really is just it's uh, streaky. Yeah, yeah. They do not want to have any part of Boston in Game 7. No, because Boston in the playoffs, no matter what's going on, they're always loud. But Game 7 against LeBron, and you got the opportunity to bounce LeBron out of the playoffs for the first time since, you know, Lord knows how long it's been since he hasn't been to the finals. They're going to be real loud for that. No, and especially the momentum has now swung back to Cleveland. Now, I'm sure Boston's saying, well, we're going back home. I, don't, I do not believe they've lost at home this entire playoff run. I don't think so either. So they're now, and if they have, it's been like one or two games. I, I can't honestly remember. I don't think they have. But now they're getting to this, to the point where they're now not feeling the pressure to win because mm-hmm. I think they're going to go, okay, now we're back on our home court. Momentum's, you know, The crowd's going to be in our favor. We're going to have a little more momentum. But I don't see how it isn't anything but Cleveland's must win because game six is going to be Cleveland's no matter what. I feel because right. like Boston, for whatever reason, they leave the TD Gardens and they just fall apart. Right. I, I wish I could explain it because the team has that much talent that for them not to show up, I just don't get. See, if I'm Boston, I'm, I'm Brad Stevens. I don't let my guys get complacent. Yeah, you're going home. Yeah, you've got a really great record at home in the playoffs. you got to get those guys to think and have the mentality that this is game seven. This is lose or go home. You just got to have that killer, you know, Mamba instinct mentality and just start shooting the ball out of the building. You know, you can't take anything for granted because as we've seen with LeBron, he can flip a switch and all of a sudden take over a game and you've just lost. Well, that's the thing. But they also need to shut down Cleveland's role players. Right. And if the role players step up, like Kyle Korver, I believe he shut down Jason Tatum last night too as we were taping on Tuesday. He made a point to really step his defense up, yeah. which I didn't think, and looking at the matchups, that was going to happen. But he really stepped his defense up. Thompson had an amazing defensive game, mm-hmm. which you kind of expect from him because he's not really known for his offense, but no. he'll get your rebounds and he'll do that. But Cleveland dominated on the defensive side of the ball. Boston struggled to find an answer, and they did get close. I mean, it's not like this was a blowout like game three. No. This was within 10, I believe. Do you think they were maybe caught off guard by how well the the role players played? Because you look at the history of the series to the, that point. You know, I know we were saying games one, game game one, and game two. You know, where are the role players? You know, they're up, you know they're on the back of a missing milk carton. I think that they were caught off guard, but at the same token, they also knew what was involved in this game. Sure. That if you let Cleveland get back in, that's a big momentum shift. Mm-hmm. And what does it say about your team that you can't win on the road? Let's say to use a comparison, it's almost like giving Tom Brady or Peyton Manning the ball in a one score or less game with like two minutes to go in a timeout. Yeah, you're just asking to lose the game because now as you're moving forward, you're going to let's say Boston wins the series, which mm-hmm. which I could, I could fully see happening. They're going to have to go to Golden State. Uh-huh. And I believe Golden State, they're both uh, two seeds, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. But I think Golden State has the advantage on them for the head-to-head. I'll say probably on the head-to-head, if not record. Yeah, so when they're going that way, and they have that in their favor, they got to win four games possibly in Golden State. And Golden State's starting to click at the right time. We'll get to that just in a little bit. But for Cleveland, though, Cleveland has now finally got it together, but they need to piece it together at Boston. They need to have the same intensity that they've been showcasing in these past couple games. Cleveland's got it together, with, you know, but use a metaphor. They've got it together with the glue, but the glue ain't dried yet. No, they need to really kick it in the gear because what they've been doing has been working, but they need a solid defensive game throughout the yes. playoffs. They didn't have that game one, and game two they really struggled. Game three they finally found it because I think Boston took them too lightly. I think that, just, uh-huh. that was a lack of focus. This time around, though, Boston was a little more prepared, albeit, though, the second quarter is when Cleveland really put the dent on them and really kind of knocked the wind out of their sails. And yeah. Boston Boston was coming back, and they were hanging in there. I think they got it the closest I remember was within eight, mm-hmm. going into late third, early fourth. But then Cleveland just turned it on. For Cleveland to get past Boston, they need game five. They need to do this in the garden, and then they have to worry about defending their home court. Can they do this? I think they can, 
But if they don't, if they lose game five, it's done. Boston will take the series. Right. This For me, this is game seven as a fan watching because if they have to go travel to Boston on game seven, I think they've already lost. Mm-hmm. They need to shut it down and shut it down early because if they don't, the series is a wrap. And for Boston, they need to know that they can win on the road, but they also need to have an answer for two very bad games that they played back-to-back, oh, yeah. which they shouldn't have because I just don't understand, per se, you just have that lack of focus, that lack of intensity throughout all four quarters in the playoffs. I don't get that. No, neither do I. I mean, I can under, I can understand it if, like, you know, they got, you know, they were taking them lightly. They were kind of cocky about it. You know, they call, you know, Cleveland comes out the gate and punches them in the jaw. Okay, yeah, they're surprised, but that surprise shouldn't last the entire game. You should be like, oh, whoa, okay. You know, you refocus and you get back in the game and you take over. Now, the only argument you can make that Cleveland definitely got this over Boston and Boston didn't have a rebound is Boston still has a very young team. Mm-hmm. And how many veteran players do they currently have on that roster? Not a whole lot. No. And you don't have your star players, which unfortunately, I think if Cleveland does win this series, that's all you're going to hear about. Yep. Well, they didn't have Kyrie Irving. They didn't have Haywood. It doesn't matter. They lost if mm-hmm. they if they do lose. And if they win, I mean, that's more feathers in Boston's cap. But for Boston, this is going to be a, a turning point no matter what because they need to get the advantage back if they want to win this series. Uh-huh. If they don't pull this off, then they're going to have some questions to answer. But I know the media is going to just really jump on and say it was Kyrie and uh, Gordon Haywood being out. I don't think that's the case. I mean, you have to look at what was the intangible that is on the court right now. I don't think the media would go with that. I know fans would go with that. You know, oh, well, we didn't have Kyrie, we didn't have Gordon. I don't think the media would go that far. They like they would, you know, obviously give the credit to LeBron and, and his crew if they win, and you know they would focus there. You know, maybe you know, Al Horford, for example, or Jason Tatum, or you know, whatever player didn't step up to their potential. I think they would, you know, kind of send their focus that way. I don't think they'd outright just go, oh well, they only lost because well, Kyrie. Wasn't no, there. but I mean that's gonna be the, that's gonna be the big headline that people are gonna focus more intently on. Sure. Which they shouldn't because Boston has a very talented team, albeit it's very young. I uh-huh. think the only team that's younger is Philadelphia right now. Yeah. But Boston still has enough players on there that they should be able to – they should have been able to win game four. Oh, yeah. In my opinion, they should have. But give credit to Cleveland because they now look like the veteran team that has been to championship games uh-huh. or to the finals for the past couple of years. They looked it because they did enough on defense to cause momentum shifts – in their favor. And their role players were finally hitting shots. J.R. Smith finally lit up. Mm-hmm. Kevin Love finally really made a statement game. Corver had a great game. Oh, yeah. When your role players are stepping up, and LeBron is having the monster games that he's having, 44 points last night, that's the points that are going to win the games. Well, yeah, because you, when you're, his role players play well on offense and defense – LeBron doesn't have to worry about everything at every single second of the game. Is he thinking about it? Yeah, it's LeBron. That's his IQ. That's his mentality. But I think he doesn't have to go so hard and overthink and overanalyze everything when, you know, Kevin Love is scoring, Kyle Korver is scoring, J.R. Smith is scoring. He can go, okay, I don't need to do everything by myself. I've got my other guys here who, hey, I'm not open. I can pass it to Kyle Korver. He's got, you know, three, four. Three point shots made. Oh yeah. Well Corver got on fire at the right point. And I think that it was kind of a nice contrast because I don't think Boston really game planned for him. No. And I think the adjustment period, that's when they gotta make those changes on the fly. And I just didn't see that in game four. But to close out the the segment with this, Boston in Cleveland's series is all it rides on game five. Yeah. In my opinion. I don't think there's any other way you get around it. For Cleveland, this is a must win. This is probably their biggest game of the season thus far. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. They need this game to really put the pressure on Boston because I don't see Boston winning when they go to Cleveland in game six. I just don't see it. If they can, if Cleveland can sneak out game five, they got the series. Right. If Boston wins, Boston is going to take this in seven. Uh-huh. And then what happens after that? They're going to meet the opponents of the West, and we're going to talk about that when we come back. You're listening to the ODPH. Hey, I'm Mike Pappy from Rye Bread, and you're listening to the ODPH. A 
coming back for the second segment on this week's ODPH, and we talked about the Eastern Conference, but now we got to talk about the Western Conference battle that is Houston versus Golden State. Let's say, would you call Game Three a battle? I wouldn't call Game Three one. Game Two definitely was, but Game Three, Golden State went Golden State, and Go- Golden State went like turn the cheat codes on and shoot the ball out of the building. Two things happened in Golden State's favor that did not happen in Game Two. They played solid defense on both ends of the court. Sure. They were all over Harden and Chris Paul. They were phenomenal in that aspect, and they got a lot of momentum shifts in their favor. And then the third quarter happened, Mm -hmm. and Steph Curry decided to officially join this finals conference playoffs. So he realized that, hey, my ankle is all good now. I can shoot. Yeah, the Western Conference finals, he was missing the past two games. He decided to make his presence finally felt, and I think that that was the wake-up call that both Golden State and Houston needed. Uh Uh-huh. Because when Curry gets rolling, there are very few people that can stop him from lighting up. Yeah, no, I I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that can, you just put him, especially on Houston, that you can just put him on and shut him down. And, yeah, with Houston, Houston's defense has always been a little suspect to begin with. But when Curry got rolling, and especially when he did the step back jumper on Harden, mm-hmm. that whole place erupted. He was shimmying. He was getting ready, and I think that that's when Houston really knew we're in trouble this game. So there was one play where uh, he rather annoyed his mother. Well, he got a little caught in the moment and said some not safe for work. Uh, comments yeah he said some not safe work comments uh his mother then texted him and says you ever say that again i'm gonna wash your mouth out with soap yeah but he he finally got involved in the game which if he is now fully warmed up and ready look out yeah it's gonna be a very short season for uh houston in this playoffs yeah i would argue and you can correct me if i'm wrong because you've seen more basketball over the years than i have i would argue curry has got the greatest range in nba history and the most deadly shot in nba history I would say he has the deadliest shot. Range wise is debatable, but he's he's in the conversation. Mm-hmm. He, he without question, he's in the conversation if he's not the guy. It's like because it seems like every time during the season, if it's the end of a quarter, end of a half, or whatever, if he's got the ball and he's pulling up for a shot from three quarter, a lot of people it's like, all right, yeah, this is gonna miss wide of the mark. Him, there's always a shot. It's going in. No, he's just one of those fearless shooters. Like you know, we talk about in uh, football, you know, fearless yep. gunslingers like Brett Favre and yep. you know Brady and such. For Curry. That's what Curry is. Curry has no fear. If Curry has no. bad games, he's surrounded by enough talent they'll carry him. But when he lights up on his own, mm-hmm. forget about it because Houston just did not have an answer. That third quarter was basically Curry versus everybody, and he yep. won. Let's say he outscored uh, Chris Paul and James Harden combined. Curry finished with 35 points. Uh, Chris Paul and James Harden combined 33. And – with Houston, the offense runs through those two. Yeah, like you said, you know, Houston really got shut down, a.k.a. shut Chris Paul and James Harden down, and odds are you're shutting Houston down. Well, yeah, because they are the focal points of that offense, and especially with Mike D'Antoni's offense, they don't – you you just shoot first, ask questions later. Mm-hmm. If Golden State isn't giving you the opportunity to shoot, that system is going to fail. Mm-hmm. And they really made a point after game two to lock it in and made sure – that the two major forces on the offensive side of the ball for Houston weren't there. Right. They took him out really quick. I mean, even role players like Sean Livingston really took it to James Harden. Oh, yeah. And when your role players are taking over games, it's going to make for a long night. Well, so and You look at the team stats, Houston went 32 of 81 uh, from the field with a percentage of 39.5. That's not going to win you anything. No. No, in comparison to Golden State. Which was 48 of 92 with a percentage of 52.2. All of their starters were in double digits. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, w- when you have that, when Golden State's clicking, like I say, they're going to be impossible to beat. Nearly impossible, should I say. It's not impossible. It's just you're in a shooting match, and how high is a scoreboard going to go? Well, that's the thing you know you're going to get. Golden State can play both sides of the ball. They play great defense when they want. When they, when they are playing great defense, should I say. Not when they want to, but some nights... They really lock it in. Game three is prime example. Right. It's not like some teams where they, you know, you look at a team and they've got one player that you look at and go, okay, this is who their scoring runs through. We shut this guy down. We got a shot at beating him. You know, but you might have somebody else on that team step up and and take the load. Golden State's the type that if Curry ain't on the ball, 
with the shot. You've got like three, four other guys who can easily step and probably are stepping up, shooting the ball out of the building. Well, that's the one thing that's always been a plus for Golden State because if Curry has a bad night, you got Kevin Durant. If Durant's having a bad night, you got Klay Thompson. You got Draymond Green. You have Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston off the bench. Albeit, though, I think I was hearing Iguodala is hurt now. He's uh, questionable, if not doubtful. I know it was one thing and it got changed this afternoon, so odds are he will play the game. Right. So, But when you have your role players that can jump in and add – value to your team mm-hmm. consistently. And Golden State does. Golden State is so stacked throughout that they should be winning games like this. And there's nothing to take away from Houston, but Houston needs to find answers. Yeah, Game two, they did. And like I said, I'm still staying with my pick. It's going to be Houston in seven. I'm not going to jump ship, even though game three will give me enough reason to. Mm-hmm. But I want to see, as we're recording tonight, is going to be Houston and, and Golden State game four. I want to see what adjustments Houston's going to have because they need to win at Golden State. So, yeah, somebody else on that team has to step up. Yes, James Harden and Chris Paul need to score. They need to do Chris Paul and James Harden things. But they cannot do it alone, you know, for because you got to know, okay, we shut them down in game three. Game four, we shut them down again. You know, you know what's going to happen. Somebody else on that team has to step up and, and make their presence known. Yeah, and I – I'm just really struggling to see, especially I want to see how they bounce back. If they lose tonight, if Houston does, and it's only by like two points, all right, they're at least right in the back in the thick of things, and they're still contending, even though they would be down 3-1. Mm-hmm. But I think they want to definitely get this tied up immediately. I was saying, well, I'm with you. If you know, I'm not writing Houston off. Yeah, I got to see what happens with game four. You know, like you said, if it's a close game, two points, three points, you know, okay, they're they're close, but the uh, you know the equation's not perfect yet. They've just got to figure out one more little piece. If they get another blowout, it's done. No, if they get blown out tonight, forget about it. Done. Like, There's like no they, way they're going to beat mentally. Gold State mentally, three in a row. they will be done. They will be broken. They'll be like, we can't beat this. No, and it's nothing against them. Just Golden State yeah. is now finally clicking at the right time, and they're stepping up to the challenge. Because I know people worried, well, they're not the number one seed. I don't think they care. No, they're just the, hey, get us to the dance and we'll be good. We don't care who our partner is. Exactly. Their season is the playoffs. They're built for this. This is their season right now. They don't want their season to end. I'll say, and if you can argue that they kind of flew under the radar this season because there wasn't a talk of, there wasn't a win streak, so there wasn't a talk of, oh, are they going to beat the whatever Lakers where it was like 33 in a row or whatever. You know, there wasn't talk of this. There wasn't talk of that. Sure, you heard about them when there was injuries, but by and large, it was the, you know, James Harden, Russell Westbrook show. It is very true. And I'll just say about this. You are right. They did have injuries that really kind of slowed them down. But other teams in the West upgraded their rosters. Yeah. Oklahoma City did, yeah. even though they didn't get that far in the playoffs. Houston definitely did. Yep. And, I mean, San Antonio will always hang in there, so that's always San Antonio. Mm-hmm. But when, you're, when your conference steps up to match your team or try to, you're going to have some nights you don't win the games. Sure. I mean, that's that's just a lot of averages. But for Golden State, throughout all their injuries, they still looked like the Golden State of old. Oh, yeah. And that is a very scary thing for opposing teams to see. Because now, if they blow out Houston tonight, the series is done. It's yeah. A ra- it's a wrap. Yeah. And then whoever they face coming out of the East, if it's Boston or it's Cleveland, I'll be very honest, I think it's going to be a very short series. I'm. I really think Golden State is now clicking at that right time. Mm-hmm. That I would love to see it go longer because I'm just a fan of the sport, and I would like to see a team out of the East win. But yeah, I just I, I just don't see it's going to happen. But I'm going to still stick with my pick because I did say Houston, and I'm not jumping off ship. But I want to see consistent defense to at least slow down Golden State. You're not going to shut them down. By no. Any means. But I need to see more out of Harden. I need to see more out of Chris Paul. I need to see more out of Trevor Reza and Capella. I need to see more out of those guys. I'll say, unless your name is Chris Paul or James Harden and you're on the Houston Rockets team, we need to see more from you. No, Chris Paul I think will bounce back too because I think Chris Paul knows. I'm not saying the window of opportunity is closing on him. I'll say it. It's closing. No, but I think for him it is getting there. I mean, for this season, yeah, the season the window is very close. Oh, yeah. But I'm saying for his career, I think he still has a couple more good years left, but he definitely needs some more help around him. I don't know what's going to happen in the offseason or with the draft. But for him, though, he's got to make that statement that, okay, now you're in the finals. Now you're in the dance. Yeah. 
you really got to make those statements, and you can't. Unfortunately for him, he's not allowed to have those bad nights. No, yeah, I'm with you. Chris Wall definitely has a couple good years left in him, and then I think you start going into you know the Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili manager minutes. Yeah, which phase. I mean that happens with all great players. Yeah, and there's no shame in saying that. It's just there's a lot of tread on the tires. Same thing with LeBron. I mean, it's going to happen to everybody. It happens to every player. Oh yeah, father time is undefeated. Mm-hmm. But for Chris Paul, he's definitely got to have a bounce-back game tonight, a really big one, and the role players need to step up. Yep, in a big way. And they have to show a better defensive effort. Now, we're not saying that every player on the team needs a triple-double. No, by no means. I think that's statistically impossible. No means. But, you know, just looking at the starters, uh, we need more than 12 points combined from the Tui and more than 13 from uh, Capella. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's just what they need to do because – now you're in the your backs are against the wall because if you go down three one, forget about it. There is no way they're gonna roll off three wins in a row. No. To get back. They could definitely sneak out tonight and then they could definitely get one more. And then after that, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be an uphill battle. Can Houston do it? We'll have to wait and see. But That's let us they play the games. Yeah, absolutely. But let us know what you think. Hashtag ODPH. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH, the greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Back on the ODPH this week, talking some Stanley Cup playoff hockey. And some records. I tell you what, at the beginning of the season, I had to peg the Rangers and somebody from the West. I will say, you always pick the Rangers. Of course, because I'm Blue Shirt Nation until I die. Shout out to We Are Rangers Town. My, my fellow Blue Shirts know the pain this season, but we'll bounce back next year. But we got to talk about this season, and like I said, out of everybody coming out of the West, I did not have Vegas picked to win and get to the finals. I don't think the wildest, most rabid Vegas fan thought they'd get there. Some might have. I'll be honest. I have, I did not. I'll hear. say there's probably people who did think that in like their wildest dreams, but by and large, I you know because you look at historically, you know the Houston Texans are the one that comes to mind because for me they're the most recent that I can think of outside of Vegas. Houston Texans didn't make it to the playoffs in their first season. Yeah, there hasn't been an, an expansion team that has really changed the game, so to speak, in any any of their first years in a long time, Mm -hmm. let alone Vegas is the first team since the St. Louis Blues in 67-68 to get to the Stanley Cup Finals. Which is is insane. It's crazy. It's like, because what did they open the season at odds-wise? It was like 500 to 1? Yeah, some some sports books in Vegas had them 500 to 1 odds to get to the Finals. Yeah, and I saw a thing online, you know, it was the biggest, single biggest bet on the Golden Knights tickets. You know, somebody put $400 on them. Uh, another person put five hundred dollars on them, uh, four hundred dollars, two fifty thousand dollars. Suffice it to say, uh, there if the Saint or excuse me, not Saint Louis Blues, the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, they win. Uh, those people will be making out real well. It's a it's a great story. I mean, because the team, because anytime you have an expansion team, you don't really have superstars because obviously, no, you're expected to struggle your first couple of years, right? Because you're it's effectively like a quilt. It's a whole bunch of other parts that are sewn together to make a whole part that doesn't quite look cohesive. Absolutely. And you take in a look at Vegas, they have a lot of parts that were, you know, grabbed from other teams. And most notably, Mark Andre Fleury, their goalie, mm-hmm. who had a very interesting career in Pittsburgh, has found new life and is playing with the biggest chip on his shoulder. I can't stress this enough because I know we only talk about hockey a little bit in the round the basis uh, segments the past couple of weeks. But he is playing with something to prove. Oh, yeah. And especially with Pittsburgh not being in the finals this year. It's almost a y'all made a mistake. You could argue it because he did everything right in Pittsburgh. And I think that no Penguins fan can say that he didn't do it. He did everything right with Murray took over. He didn't make a big fuss and demand a trade. I don't know. Penguins fans might, might argue, you know, he had a bad game every now and then, but what goalie doesn't? Well, that's the thing, but it's hockey. And hockey, the, the pressure <laughs> is on the goalie more than anybody. And if your goalie is hot at the right time, look out. Mm-hmm. This is the stuff of legends for playoffs. 
And if your goalie is going to get you there, Flurry is literally taking the whole city of Vegas on his back, and it's the us against them mentality. No, yeah, you're right on the whole goalie thing. I mean, I remember the one game when I was going to college, uh, Rangers were playing the Senators, and it went into overtime or something like that. It was like 0-0 tie, and I was like, oh, wow, this is actually you know kind of impressive. And I looked up the shots on goal, and it was like at the end of regulation, it was like 50-something shots on goal for both teams. Not combined. Each team had like 50 shots. So I'm like, Henrik, stop 50. What? Yeah, Henrik plays out of his mind. But that's the thing. When you have a goalie that is defending that much, you can't really argue it. Well, and you would and you would think that like when they start taking all these shots, that like eventually fatigue would set in. They're like, all right, you're slowing down. They might miss one. Good goalie, they'll step up and they'll keep going. Yeah. And for Vegas, I mean, they're living and dying by Fleury's play, which is a, he's playing, like I said, phenomenal right now. And he's yeah. playing with such a chip on his shoulder. And I think the pressure of him not being in Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh, there's an expectation to win. There's a tr- there's a history, there's a tradition that, you know, it steeps through Penguins history, but it also steeps through Steelers, you know, legacy and the Pirates and everything, just everything with that city sports-wise. Well, I think when you have the success that the Penguins have had and the Steelers have had. Uh, Pirates, Penguins especially recently. Yeah, Pirates not so much lately, just unfortunately, but with those two franchises in town and especially what you know what you're getting because you have arguably, as much as I hate saying this, the best player of hockey on the planet, yeah. Sidney Crosby, and you have Malkin when he's healthy, and you have Pittsburgh is always in it. They always just hang in there and they hang tough. So the expectation to win is there. So when you remove that from Flurry, who is going to a team that, let's be honest, Nobody really had them pegged to go win the whole thing. No, nobody. You got you got to be honest. I mean, if you outside of the city of Vegas, because I'm sure they really have embraced this team, and it looks it too. Because if you ever watch the games on TV, if you're not there, they do show live shots all through Vegas. Sure, and they're having parties. They are really embracing it, and it's so cool to see. I mean, as somebody that's been to Vegas many times, to see them really get behind the sports franchise and really make it into a hockey town experience. I know we talk about this with Nashville a lot. Right. The just places you don't think would really embrace hockey. And I, Vegas does. See, that doesn't surprise me necessarily because you look at what's in Vegas, the shows, the acts, the this, the that, that's all outside stuff. That's you know, I know the Backstreet Boys are there performing. That's somebody outside coming in. Britney Spears was just there. That's outside coming in. I know Cirque du Soleil has a show there. Outside coming in. This is something that is natural, that is essentially homegrown. Yeah, the guys aren't from Vegas. You know, they weren't born and raised. Maybe some of them were. But this is something natural, organic, and just came to the city and said, hey, we're here. We're not on a six-month residency that we're going to leave after six months. We're here to stay. That is a very valid point, Pat. And for Vegas, I, the only thing that I would say is for their fans, I, I, it, they're going to be very spoiled. Right. Because yeah. Your first yeah. year out of the gate, you win if they win the cup. I mean, the one I, the one instance of that I can remember is when the Celtics won the uh, NBA championship last. I think I believe it was what was it? Two thousand. Garnett Pierce and yeah, what was and it? Ray Allen. Glenn Big Baby Davis won an NBA championship in his first year. I'm like, well, that's a heck of a rookie season. Yeah, I mean, if you have that first season and your team is winning, I mean, that's a lot of momentum to go on. But yeah, what fans are just, especially ones that are just joining a sport, are going to have to realize. Not every year you win. Yeah. There are down years. Well, and people are going to tell them, hey, you had a good year. Congratulations to you. You're not going to win every year. Yeah. To say this isn't the New York Yankees in the 50s. But to say that Vegas should not enjoy this, isn't. they should definitely Oh, absolutely. This. They should embrace this. They should celebrate this. The fact your team is in the finals, congratulations. That is an awesome stat. And I know, you know, Fleury and the rest of the guys are really going to have to make a heck of a run to close it out. Oh, yeah, and I know a lot of people are getting on board. I know somebody I follow on Twitter retweeted a photo from uh, a fan who was at in Vegas, wanted it, was really starting to jump behind and get behind the team and support them, you know, and they wanted to go buy a, a T-shirt, not a jersey, not a hat, a simple T-shirt. And the floor, I know you'll get this, and anyone who's seen photos will get this. The f- They were coming down an escalator from wherever it was, a mall, or the arena, wherever it was. It looked like the floor of New York Comic Con for just people buying merch. That is amazing. If that's at the T-Mobile where they play, I, I they, they didn't say where it was. It wasn't tagged where it was. It was in a public place. The person was coming down an escalator. The floor looked like something out of a Comic Con convention. That's just amazing. See, that's the beauty of sports is bringing a lot of people together, and you're rooting for your team. And if they win or lose, hey, you're embracing the moment that you're in. There. Right. That's the great thing about sports is it doesn't matter what's going on in the world with news events whatever you get into an arena whether it be hockey baseball football basketball i'll even rope wrestling into this you know the wwe 
you're there for three hours or more. You don't care what's going on. You're there with fans. You're there with you know temporary friends, and you're just having a good time. It's a great thing about sports, and Vegas should definitely embrace this and run its course. You know, if they win the cup or if they face the or they lose to the winner of Game Seven in the Eastern Conference. Two best words in sports. There is no bigger pressure situation than Game Seven in playoff hockey, and I will stress nope. this. Playoff hockey is an animal unto itself. So this isn't like Game 7 in baseball where I'd say after the fifth or sixth inning, things start getting tense. This isn't like, you know, the Super Bowl where it's it's it gets tense towards the end of the game. No, this is like three periods, barring and going into overtime, of it just white knuckle, you're growing gray hairs. Yeah, this is the, epin- the epitome of just pressure sports. So I know a couple of Rangers situations added some gray hairs to my head. We don't need to discuss that right now because hey, I'm just, yeah, saying, yeah. just saying it. I'm, I'm, given, game seven is giving me gray hairs. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I've been watching hockey a little longer than you, my friend. Like I say, when Messier called his shot back in '94, nothing will make you more white knuckle than that. Right. But Tampa Bay versus Washington, game six. Washington stepped up, won at home. A great game by Holby was shut, doing a shutout. Yep, and. TJ Oshie and Smith Pelly all had great games. And now it's game seven. What is going to be the prediction in the room? They're at Tampa. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I know we like to refer to sometimes Tampa as New York Rangers self because there are a lot of former Rangers on the team. Uh, however, Tampa's won it. Just for the sake of somebody new, you know, somebody who hadn't done it before or at least done it in a long time, I want to see Washington do it. You know, they've, they've got the monkey off their back and getting past Pittsburgh and getting past – Crosby, you know they're in the you know they're in the Eastern Conference Finals. I want to see him get to the get to the Stanley Cup. The thing that's going to be the craziest thing to me is this is going to be Ovechkin's legacy, <coughs> and it shouldn't be. No, but this is going to be the moment that is looked back on because I'm not saying he had an easy road to get here, but they beat Pittsburgh. Yep, that is like when Boston beat the Yankees to get to their World Series. Sure. When they finally beat their rival, and now Tampa Bay was going to definitely step up to the occasion. There's no yeah, they, they were going to go. Oh no, they beat Pittsburgh. No, and Tampa will hang in there too. I mean, this is not going to be a blowout by any means, but this is Ovechkin's game for mm-hmm. his legacy. Holpe needs to play great. He can't have a bad night. So he's going to play like a man possessed. They all do. Every team does. Tampa Bay does as well. They really need Stamkos and company to really light it up. Oh yeah. But I think Ovechkin is gonna do it. I just I'm not saying a team of destiny thing. Right. But just something is screaming that Ovechkin's moment is tonight. That he's either gonna have a two goal, one assist game, and it's gonna be a two one final. You know, like give me the puck and get behind me and stay out of my way mentality. He's got to. Because I'm not gonna say the window is shutting there. I know we we're talking about that last segment. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. For Washington. Yeah. Washington has had great teams over the past couple of years, and you can look back on it. But either they can't get past the Rangers or they can't get past the Penguins. Tampa is no slouch, and it should not be taken as one. And like I say, I root for them to win because there's a lot of former Rangers on that team. But I just think, for me, this is Ovechkin's time. No, yeah, like you said, the window is proverbial proverbially closing on Ovechkin. I mean, he's been in the league a lot longer than I think people realize. He was drafted in 2004. Yeah, and that's a lot of hockey, and he plays uh-huh. at a high pace. He's not exactly somebody that camps out in front of the net and just gets no. garbage shots. No, he's up and down the ice, full tilt. Yeah. For him, this is it. Yeah. In my opinion, he's got to cash in tonight. So his leg- Like you said, his legacy shouldn't be about this. His legacy should be the scorer he is and, and the creative ways he did it, just the way he played. Oh, he'll be a Hall of Famer without question. Right, but, but this is his legacy. But this is going to get looked on as, you know, when we describe Hall of Famers, do you win a chip or do you not? <laughs> is it a nice story or is there a legacy? He's now finally gotten to the dance. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot like we said with Chris Paul last segment. But for Ovechkin, he is the Capitals. He, oh, yeah. He has got to be the benchmark and the pace car for them to get where they need to get. Yep. He needs. He can't just have a good game. He needs a mm-hmm. great game. And like I said, if he can get two goals and one assist, I think they can do it. It's not to say Tampa's not going to because Tampa is going to match him every bit of the way. 
and it's going to be a great game to watch. But if you're asking me to pick, as much as it pains me, because like I say, I do root for former Rangers like Ryan Callahan and company down there. I'm taking Ovechkin, yeah, and I'm taking Washington two to one tonight. No, yeah, it, it to me it just feels like it's Ovechkin's time. Yeah, I mean it just it is what it is. But let us know what you think. Are you excited for hockey as much as we are? Because I definitely want to hear it on the Facebook, and I want to hear it on the Twitter. I want to hear it on the Instagram. Let us know. Hashtag ODPH. What's your thoughts on the Stanley Cup playoffs? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Mike C. from I Am Horror. You're listening to the ODPH, the most killer podcast on the planet. Coming back for the final segment on this week's ODPH, and you know how we started off. How about that local minute, Pad? All right, a little bit of Rumble Ponies news. Rumble Ponies are sitting at 22 and 20, five games back of the first place Trenton Thunder. Got some room to work on a one game winning streak, so definitely making some improvements. As for the schedule, uh, this week they have a double header on Wednesday against Richmond, and then uh, they're playing Richmond on Thursday. Friday, they are opening a series with Bowie. They play them Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So definitely some interesting stuff there. Got a couple promotions going this weekend. Uh, Friday, they got a fireworks series going on. Saturday, now this is interesting. There's one I know a lot of uh, minor league teams have been doing, and that's, you know, one day, one game only, change the name for something local. Oh, okay. So Saturday night, that for one night only, they will no longer be the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. They will be the Binghamton Speedies. Now, if you're not from the 607, a Speedy is a type of sandwich that started here in the 607. Um you should just Google it because I can't do it justice. It's a delicious it, sandwich. Oh, yeah. Essentially, it's cubes of meat, whether it be pork, lamb, chicken, it, and it's uh, covered in a marinade. Uh, and then Saturday, Sunday night, excuse me, Star Wars night. So that will be a big weekend if you are able to get to Nice Egg Stadium. Yep. BingRP.com for more ticket information. So shout out to the Rumble Ponies. Definitely get down there. I definitely want to get down for Speedy Night. Yeah, just I mean, it's the true essence of minor league baseball because it's always supposed to be a little fun, a little, mm-hmm. a little quirky, if you will. So yeah. obviously, it's going to be kind of weird seeing the Speedy name, and I, I believe it's an actual sandwich as the picture for their hat. Yeah, it is. So it's going to be it's a fun night. I'm going to get a hat. Yeah, It'd so, be something. Yeah, just something, just something a little different, but something to have a little fun with because going into Memorial Day weekend, yeah. the official kickoff weekend of summer, I guess you could say. Yep. So definitely go out and definitely enjoy it. So now we got to go start those round in the bases. Now, since Coach Duffy and Sound Guy Galore JR are not here, we're going to have a little extended version of rounding the bases. Oh, yeah. So, Pad, you want to start us off? Yeah, a little bit of baseball news. Of course, as we're sitting here recording, we're getting breaking news. Uh, Jose Batista, the six-time All-Star who was recently released by the Atlanta Braves, has signed a one-year deal with the New York Mets and will be in the lineup. Interesting. So signing him there, bringing him in. So that'll be that'll be interesting. You know, home run header, great fielder. It'll be interesting to see where they plug him in and what they do with him. Uh, then, of course, we mentioned it at the start of the show. How about them Yankees? New York is setting offensive records left and right. Yeah, which is kind of scary to think about because, yeah. as Yankee fans as Pat and I are, and we'll 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 save our you know biased opinions as much as we can on this. The Yankees at the start of the season, we really didn't know what to expect. I mean, on paper, everybody looks great. But to see it now finally kick into fruition, and really they're dominating games for the most part on Mm -hmm. on the offensive side. Pitching, a little suspect here and there. Sure, that comes and goes. Yes, but the hitting is clicking at the right time, and especially with how hot Boston started out the series. Yeah. But they're setting a record that – wasn't touched upon since the 1950s? Well, yeah, 1960s, yeah. They hit four or more home runs in three consecutive games, which for them is a franchise record. Yeah. Which, when you think about, like, you're not even if you're a Yankee fan, if you're a baseball fan and you know the players who have, you know, worn that jersey, that's impressive. It, it, and it's also the first time a road team has done that since 1961, and it was the Milwaukee Braves. It's a little crazy to think about that the, Yan- the this version of the Yankees, I know they're getting a lot of hype early. Sure. But they're earning it. 
and they're putting up the numbers to warrant it. Now, am I saying, you know, give them the chip already? No. No, by no means. But you have to give them their due, that they're definitely clicking at the right time. And so far, the Aaron Boone experiment is working. Mm-hmm. I definitely want to see where they're at by All Star break to kind of get yeah. more of a more of a comfortable feel. Because for me, we really don't start kicking in baseball until like June. It, yeah, it, it's it's sort of like you know the first months of like the NBA season where it's like you're going through, you're finally getting your chemistry going with your teammates, and then you know by Christmas Day, that's when everybody says, "Oh, the season really starts." Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same way because once you get to like June and the weather is nice and everybody is finally, I don't want to say on a level playing field, but if you play games in the Northeast in April. It's not a fun experience. No, it's rain and possibly snow. Mm-hmm. Now it's pretty much warm wherever you go. The weather is average, so there really is no excuses. And now you really see what you got with your teams. No, yeah, and the, and the interesting thing with the Yankees is they're you know they're already playing good. They're already playing great. They're only going to get better. I mean, you've got Tommy Canley coming back possibly this week. You've got Adam Warren who was out. Both of these guys, bullpen guys, you know, coming back sometime in June. And there's talk of Greg Bird coming back either this weekend or next week. It's definitely going to be something to watch. I know the other teams in the Major League Baseball are going to be definitely stepping their games up too because Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be a runaway season by any means, but I think you're going to see some more call-ups happen. I know Vlad Guerrero Jr.'s name has been getting mentioned quite often. Yeah, he's getting a uh, fair amount of coverage, and deservedly so. I mean, when you're hitting home runs off the side of hotels in left field at ballparks you're playing at, you really deserve to be mentioned. And I know that once he gets called up, that's going to be a lot of hype behind him. I mean, oh, yeah. The minor league system has got a lot of talent down there. So it's a wait-and-see approach. I'm saying, yeah, shout-out to the guy. I, for, I think it's Soto is the guy's last name. Uh, made his major league debut last night. Yep. 19 years old, hit a home run. Uh, I can tell you what I was doing at 19 years old. It wasn't hitting a home run. <laughs> Definitely not. But you got to say, the future of baseball is looking bright. Oh, yeah. So depending on how your team is looking in their farm system, you got to either say it's going to be a bright future or there's going to be some work to do. But uh-huh. if you're a Yankee fan, you got to love it right now. And some of the other teams have really developed their system as well. Oh, yeah. It's a great time to be a fan of baseball. Yep. So for me, I'm going to be switching to the MMA minute because there's been a lot of news coming out. And one fight going on this weekend, actually, on Fox Sports 1 has been having a lot of great fight cards going on. I know last weekend they had a real superb one from Chile. But this one is going to be over in England. Yep. And, and if you're on the East Coast, it's going to be starting about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Nothing wrong with a little afternoon uh, MMA. No, definitely not, and especially if you got cable and you can watch it. Definitely check it out. But the main event is the one that intrigues me the most, and that is Stephen Thompson, Wonder Boy, the number one ranked contender in the 170 division, is fighting Darren Till, mm-hmm. the number eight ranked UFC 170 contender. And it's going to be a very interesting fight. Till is currently undefeated. He's been on a tear, obviously, if he hasn't lost. But he's had a couple decision wins. And most importantly, he did beat Donald Cerrone versus TKO, um, or via TKO, rather, his last fight, which has now skyrocketed him in the top ten. So anytime he beats Cerrone, it's a definite feather in your cap. Yeah. So for him, and especially, he has a very... A lot of hype, I guess I could say. Sure. Since I don't think that they've had a uh, fighter coming from the United Kingdom have this much hype since uh, Michael Bisping, maybe Dan Hardy. Yeah. You know, those those two names that jump out. But Till has definitely a lot of momentum behind him. And for him to get Stephen Thompson, Wonder Boy, that's a huge fight for him. Now, Thompson is coming off, you know, win against Jorge Masvidal. And he came off the back-to-back fights against Tyrone Woodley, the draw and the loss by decision. So Wonder Boy definitely needs this fight, I think. But for Till, I mean, this is high risk, high reward. He's going to be going up against a guy that is very hard to game plan against. Wonder Boy's karate is very high level. It's kind of like when uh, early Leo Machida, like they yep. they fight yep. very similar. But it can definitely be a winnable fight for Till. But Till needs to have a lot of pressure on Thompson. If he doesn't press him that much and he lets Thompson dictate the pace, he's going to be in trouble. But I think Till can win this. And then if Till wins, I know that there's a fight coming up between Colby Covington and Rafael Dos Anjos uh-huh. for the interim 170 belt. I know Tyrone Woodley is going to be coming back from injury, and he is still the champion at 170. Yep. So there's going to be a lot of fighters that is he's going to get attached to should he beat Thompson. If Thompson wins, 
I think he would get somebody either a Rafael dos Anjos or he gets a Covington. I don't think that they would be so apropos to really push for a fight against Woodley just yet. No. I think after you've seen a couple fights between them, you definitely want to build it back up and maybe get a little more draw for it. But I think that this fight is just definitely going to have a lot of ramifications for 170 going forward. Yeah, oh yeah, there's there's some definite ripples that are going to come out of this fight, no matter who wins. No, and I think there's going to be a lot of hype on Darren Till to really make a statement. Can he do it? I think he can. And like I said, my prediction is he's going to win via decision. I think that he's going to put enough pressure on Wonder Boy that he's going to just eke out the win. I don't see him knocking out Thompson. No. It might happen, but Thompson, he does fight very disciplined. He does not get in any crazy slugfests. He's really going to try imposing his will and really setting the tone. And like I said, he throws a lot of kicks at various angles. Like I said, his karate is very high level. So thus for him, he's going to definitely throw Till off his game because I think Till is going to want to come in there and brawl with him straight up, which I think if you really want a good comparison of how he should go about it, watch Shogun Hua's fight against Machida the second one. Okay. And he just bull rushes him and just never lets him get time to set up. If Till does that, he's got a great shot to win. Is he going to do that? I don't know. It's a tall order. It's a very tall order. It's possible. But like I said, my prediction for that is Till wins via decision. And then after that, like I said, we got some big fight cards coming up for the UFC. I know Romero and Whitaker, too, is going to be coming in just a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the same fight card, if I'm not mistaken, with Covington. And Dos Anjos. Yep. And then International Fight Week, which I believe is July 7th? In that neighborhood, yeah. That's the one that you're going to have Stipe Miocic versus Daniel Cormier. Oh, boy. You're going to have Max Holloway and Brian Ortega. You're, oh, boy. You're going to have – that fight card is so stacked that we here at the ODPH have a very special edition of the show for that week. And we have two guests coming on. One is a king – the other is a common man. That's all I'm going to tease you with for just now. But if you've been listening to the show, you probably have a very good idea who we're bringing on to break down that fight and talk a little MMA with us on the show. So definitely stay tuned for that. You'll hear a, bit, a little bit more about that as the weeks are progressing towards the first week of July. But definitely stay tuned for that. Uh-huh. Pat, you got anything else for us this week? Yeah, just a quick uh, little bit of breaking news again as we record because, hey, it's nice when this stuff happens while we're recording and not after. Uh, former UFC champ uh, Fabricio Verdum is uh, facing potential anti-doping violation as uh, one of his test samples was flagged uh, for out-of-camp uh, testing. Mm. And he just signed that deal to fight in Russia the other day. Yeah, he just signed for a fight, too. That's that's always tough to hear. Yeah, and of course, this is coming from USADA. It's being reported by Brett Okamoto of ESPN. You know, it's just – it's one thing – for fighters to be caught, and it's just it's tough when it's like one of your fighters that you always watch and you're yep. always really good. It's, it's a name that, like, you know, the casual fan or the once in a while fans won't recognize, but it's the name that you and I and some of the folks we watch with would recognize. Yeah, absolutely. And but you know, USADA is doing their thing and they're cleaning yeah. up the sport, and that's what you want. You want an even playing yep. field when you're fighting in the UFC or an MMA and any MMA organization. Yep, without question, because you definitely want it to be. <laughs> You know, one one team versus the other team, and as fair as e- even balanced game as possible. Same thing with in the fight game too, as well. And you know, they're doing a great job cleaning it up. It just, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's tough because that's one of your fighters that you really root for, and you really like, you know, you really like yeah. how they fight. So it's a tough break. And we'll see what happens from there. Definitely, we'll see what happens. But let us know what you think. Hashtag ODPH. So for Coach Duffy, who could not make it in this week, and for the Sound Guy Galore Jr. Hashtag ODPH. If you know his whereabouts. And for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Kenham. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.